Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's session of the Washington History Seminar, Historical Perspectives on International and National Affairs. And this afternoon, we focus on a new book by Philip Estrom entitled On Account of Sex, Ruth Bader Ginsburg and the Making of Gender Equality Law, published in late June in the Landmark Law Cases and American Society series of the University of Kansas Press. Our discussant this afternoon is the political historian, Elizabeth Tandy Shermer. I'm Eric Arneson from the George Washington University, co-chair of the Washington History Seminar, along with my colleague and fellow co-chair Christian Osterman of the Woodrow Wilson Center, who cannot be with us today. The Washington History Seminar is a collaborative, nonpartisan venture of the Wilson Center's History and Public Policy Program and the American Historical Association. And for over the past decade, the seminar has been meeting weekly in pre-COVID times and in person at the Wilson Center. And since the pandemic and post-pandemic here in the virtual realm. Behind the scenes are two people who make these seminars possible, Pete Bierstecker of the Wilson Center and Rachel Wheatley of the American Historical Association. And on the logistics front, please note, today's session is being recorded and can soon be found on our institution's respective websites. And when we get to the question and answer section of the webinar, we ask those of you with questions to use the raise hand function. That way you can pose the question yourself or the Q&A function on Zoom, in which case I get to pose the question and we will call on as many folks as we can. And today's session is being sponsored by the American Historical Association. All right, with those preliminaries out of the way, let me turn to our speakers this afternoon. It is my genuine pleasure to introduce our author, Philip Estrum, who is the former Wilson Center Director of U.S. Studies and Emerita Professor at the City University of New York. Her books include Louis Dembitz Brandeis, published in 1984, nominated for a Pulitzer Prize, When the Nazis Came to Skokie, 1999, and Women in the Barracks, published in 2002, about Ruth Bader Ginsburg's most important Supreme Court gender equality opinion. A frequent lecturer at home and abroad, she is also the recipient of a prize for scholarly writing about the Supreme Court, presented by then Chief Justice William Rehnquist. And I had the pleasure of co-chairing the Washington History Seminar uh, a number of uh, uh, years ago uh, when she stepped in to replace Christian Osterman when he was on sabbatical from the Wilson Center. Today, Philippa will be talking about her just published book, On Account of Sex, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, and the making of gender equality law. Philippa, welcome back, I should say, to the Washington History Seminar. Great to have you here. The screen, all yours. Thank you. Thank you so much, Eric. Um, thank you to Christian, even though you're not here today, Christian. And let me echo the thanks to Pete and Rachel, who really make this whole thing work. And also particular thanks to Professor Shermer, for stepping in and doing this on a kind of expedited basis, which I know is not easy, but we're really very, very grateful to you. All right, that being said, let me uh, jump right in here and tell you first why it is that, um, why it is that I wrote this book and what it's about. Um, we, in this country now have come almost to venerate Ruth Bader Ginsburg. And my thesis, which is certainly not original with me, is that while she was a good judge and a very good justice, she wasn't superb in those jobs. She wasn't out of the ordinary. She wasn't head and shoulders above a lot of her predecessors. But what did make her special was the litigation that she undertook for gender equality in the 1970s. And what I try to do in the book is lay out, as it hasn't been laid out quite this way anywhere else, is exactly what all of that consisted of. Um, I start with the cover of this book, not just because it's the commercial, but because I want you to see what she looked at looked like back in, in those days. I mean, we think of her as, you know, with the big glasses and the judicial color, but she was an absolutely stunning, stunning woman. She was raised in, uh-oh, um, okay, there we go. Uh, 
She was raised in an immigrant family in Brooklyn, went through the Brooklyn public schools, and then went to Cornell on a full scholarship. And this is a, a picture of her there. While she was there, she met the man who became her husband. So her name was not what it had been initially, which was Joan Ruth Bader and became Ruth Bader Ginsburg. And the reason there was no Joan in her name is that when she started elementary school in Brooklyn, there were so many Jones in her class that it was decided she had to drop that name. So she became Ruth Bader. She and her husband, Marty Ginsburg, both went to Harvard Law School. But when Ruth went, she was one of nine women in a class of almost 500. She rose to the very top of her class. And this is a picture of the staff meeting the students on the Harvard Law Review. And as you see, of all of those, there were only two women. Ruth is all the way over on the right. It was a very male-centric society that she lived in. It. When she got out of Harvard Law School and then Columbia Law School, because her husband was one year ahead of her in law school, he got a job in New York City. And so she switched to Columbia. And so actually she got her degree from Columbia Law School. When she did that and was ready to do what people at the top of her class, which she was again, uh, normally did, which was go to work as a clerk for a judge or justice, she just discovered that basically nobody wanted women. And particularly nobody wanted married women. And even more particularly, Nobody wanted married women with a child, which is what she had by that time. And so through a circuitous route, she eventually ended up teaching at Rutgers Law School. Now, this is the 1960s. Most of her students were men, but there was gradually a critical mass of young women, many of whom had come out of the new women's movement. And they asked her if she would consider doing something that was revolutionary. And that was teach a course in women and the law. She had been teaching civil procedure. She didn't really know about women and the law. And she said, well, let me look around. And so as she told it, she read everything there was to read on women and the law. And there was very little. So it didn't take her a great deal of time. However, what she did discover was all pretty negative. Going back to the 19th century, she discovered that the first time the Supreme Court had spoken about the equality or the inequality of women was in the case of Myra Bradwell. Bradwell was married to an attorney. She became very interested in the law and she started what quickly became the nation's outstanding newsletter about law and decisions that had been handed down by various courts. And at some point, she decided that in addition to writing about the law, she would like to practice law. So she did what most people did who wanted to become lawyers back in those days when there were relatively few law schools. She read law with her husband and then took the bar exam and passed it with flying colors, and then did what was the appropriate thing, which was applied to the Supreme Court of Illinois, which credentialed people for the bar. And she discovered that the Supreme Court of Illinois said, oh, no, you can't become a lawyer. You're a woman. We don't believe in that kind of thing. Well, she thought that this was a violation of the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment, which was passed at the end of the Civil War. And this is just the relevant part of that amendment, which says that states can't deny anybody the equal protection of the laws. And she said, I'm not getting equal protection if I'm not being judged or credentialed on the same basis as men. Her case eventually went to this 
group of eminent gentlemen. And of course, gentlemen is the relevant word here. They're all white men looking very solemn. And what they told her was, no, no, of course you can't become a lawyer. And we're going to decide this case on the basis of something called rational relation. Now, rational relation basically is a standard by which the court says, is there any possible way that we consider, we can consider this law to be rational? And their answer was, yeah, it's very rational to keep women out of the courtroom because after all, what do you get in the courtroom? You get all the uglinesses of human behavior. We don't want women to be exposed to that. So the state of Illinois and its wisdom saying women can't be part of, of the legal profession, very rational and very constitutional. A couple of years later, we get Virginia Minor who decided she wanted to vote in the presidential election. She went to uh, register herself and Mr. Happersett, who was the registrar, said, of course you cannot vote, you're a woman. And so Virginia Minor said the same thing that Myra Bradwell had done, that this was a violation of equal protection of the laws. And here you had the gentleman of the court who heard her case. And again, what they said was, please, let's not be ridiculous. Women cannot vote. Or as Ruth Bader Ginsburg would say many years later, they said to Virginia Minor, you wouldn't let children vote, would you? So why would you let women vote? Well, that's 19th century. It may seem like ancient history. 1948, right after the end of the Second World War, and Valentine Gosart had inherited a bar in Michigan from her husband. Now, during the Second World War, many of the bars in Michigan, as elsewhere in the United States, were run by women because the men were abroad fighting. The men came back, and of course, they wanted to take over again. And the Michigan Bartenders Association got the state to pass a law that a woman could not work in a bar unless she was the wife or the daughter of the owner. And what they said to the Michigan legislature while the law was being considered was alcohol makes for enough trouble. Why add women to the mix? And so Valentine Gosart was told, no, you cannot run the bar. Well, that 1948 may seem a long time ago. Let's skip to 1961. And I assume that some of the people who are watching this program can remember being alive in 1961. And here we have the case of Gwendolyn Hoy. Gwendolyn Hoy was a battered woman, what we would today say is a victim of domestic violence. And at one point, she, arguing with her husband, took one of their children's broken baseball bats and kind of whacked him with it, thinking she, she would hit him on the shoulder. She didn't. She hit him in the head. He was rushed off to the hospital, and he died. And she was convicted of first-degree murder, and sentenced to 30 years in prison. She was convicted by an all-male jury. And so she appealed, or a lawyer appealed the case to the Supreme Court of the United States, saying this is a violation of equal protection, as well as the fact that she had not gotten a jury of her peers. Well, here's the court that heard her plea. Sitting in the middle, we have one of the great civil libertarians, Chief Justice Earl Warren, to his, um, his left. You get another great civil libertarian, Felix Frankfurter, all the way over to our left. You get William Douglas, another one of the great civil libertarians. And what they said unanimously, all, all of those civil libertarians agreed, of course, it was perfectly rational to keep women off a jury. Because again, just like the business of putting women in a courtroom, you're going to hear all kinds of nasty things besides which 
women are still the bulwark of the home. They need to be home taking care of their husbands and their children. It would be really unfair to them to expect them to sit in a jury room. So this is what Ruth Bader Ginsburg found when she looked at the history of women and law in the United States. And then in 1971, she learned about the case of Sally Reed. Sally Reed was a divorced woman in the state of Idaho. When she and her husband divorced, they, as the parents of a teenage boy named Skip, were told that she could have custody of Skip, but he had to spend weekends with his father, which he did. He didn't particularly get along with his father and his father's new family. And on one particular weekend, Skip called Sally and begged her to take him home. And she said, my hands are tied. There's nothing I can do. The court has said your father has, in effect, custody of you on, on the weekends. Skip, totally distressed, went down to the basement of his father's house took his father's rifle and killed himself. And Sally, devastated, applied to become executor of Skip's estate, not because there was anything in it, in particular, he was just a teenage kid, but because she held her, her ex-husband responsible for Skip's death and she didn't want him to have Skip's things. Gradually, the case worked its way up to the Supreme Court, where Ruth Bader Ginsburg wrote her very first brief that went to a federal court of the United States. This is the, what uh, Sally Reed found, that the Idaho statute that was relevant here said that if a woman and a man apply to be executor, automatically the man is named executor. The court doesn't even have to look any farther. Well, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, now for the first time, putting something before the Supreme Court of the United States, realized that she had two problems. One was the rational relation test. How to move from the rational relation test to something else. And the second was how to persuade the justices, still an all-male court, how to persuade the justices of the United States that stereotyping men and women hurt women, but also hurt men. Here's the first page of the brief that she and Mel Wolf, who was then a legal director of the ACLU, handed to the court. And I'm showing this to you basically because I want you to look at the right hand of uh, the brief where her name is listed right under her name are the names Pauli Murray and Dorothy Kenyon. And those were two, uh, at that point, uh, members of the ACLU National Board of Directors who had been pushing and pushing and pushing for years for the ACLU to get more active in the field of women's rights. Pauli Murray, I don't know whether any of you have seen the documentary that was produced fairly recently about Pauli Murray, an extraordinary uh, woman. When Pauli Murray was a law student at Howard Law School, she suggested that the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment could be used, all right, she's back in the 30s now, could be used to fight for racial equality. And at that point, her professors and everybody else laughed at her. Um, much later, when Thurgood Marshall was writing his brief for Brown versus Board of Education, he uh, relied rather heavily on what Pauli Murray had argued way back when. All right, so the brief goes to the Supreme Court. And what Ginsburg puts in her brief is this. Remember, her first challenge was how to get rid of the rational relation test. 
And what she says is to the justices, I want you to decide on the basis of suspect classification. Now, what the Supreme Court had been doing for some decades was to say, if a law distinguishes between people on the basis of race, we are going to assume that that law is unconstitutional. Therefore, it'll be up to the government to prove not only is it constitutional, but it is in the service of a very legitimate purpose. And there's no other way to get there so that the government has a compelling interest in that. So now all of a sudden, the government has to prove that a law is constitutional. Well, said Ginsburg, that's what should be done in the instance of sex as well as race. She's saying, like you see here, it's really the same thing. It's people who have been discriminated against. Then she hands in her brief. And I'm just going to quickly show you some pages of her brief because I think many of us have a notion of briefs as being one, the citation of one precedent after another in legal treatises and tomes. What she did was she gave the court page after page of statistical information, sociological treatises, feminist books, basically all geared to the second challenge that she had, which is to show the court that the things that supposedly were being good for women, like keeping them out of the courtroom, actually hurt women. But her argument would be they hurt men well. The stereotyping hurt men as well as women. So as you see, page after page of such citations. And here's the court that was going to hear the case. Now, two of the justices of the Supreme Court had, had resigned and um, their successors hadn't yet been confirmed to the court. So it's a court of only seven. It's still all now, but up in the right hand corner, you see Thurgood Marshall. So there was one non-white person on the court, Thurgood Marshall having been appointed by Lyndon Johnson. And what that court said was, no, we're not going to go so far as suspect classification. That's a little bit farther than we're ready to go right now. But we're going to redefine the rational relation test. And we're going to say that not only must a distinction among people in a law be reasonable, it can't be arbitrary. And there's got to be a real relationship to the object of the law. And what did this make of Sally Reed's case? Well, the answer was, if the purpose of the law is to find the best executor, then logically, a court should look at all the people who are petitioning to become executor and not make an arbitrary decision based on the sex of one of the people who asked to be executor. So we have a slightly different test now for sex discrimination cases. At that point, the American Civil Liberties Union decided to begin a project on women's rights that would be devoted to fighting against sex discrimination. And it asked RBG to become the director of the project. At the same time, Columbia Law School asked that she would like to come teach there because Columbia, we're now in 1971, Columbia had just discovered that, oh, there are a lot of women who want to become law professors and there are a lot of women students. And also there's this federal government that thinks we really shouldn't be discriminating in our hiring. And so really we want to hire a woman. And so she just agreed that she would work half time at the Women's Rights Project and half time at Columbia Law School. And so it was as head of the Women's Rights Project that she would take the cases that she brought to the court over the next decade and that gradually led the court to declare that sex discrimination 
was somewhat suspect. I'm not going to go over all of the cases that she brought, but I want to focus on this one because it shows exactly the way she went about her business. This is Stephen Wiesenfeld. Stephen Wiesenfeld was a computer consultant. He was married to Paula Wiesenfeld, who was a high school teacher. And as a high school teacher, she had paid uh, her part of her salary to, into the social security system. When the Wiesenfelds decided that they finally wanted to have a family, Paula got pregnant and tragically, Paula died in childbirth, giving birth to Jason Paul. Well, Stephen had always said he would be the primary caretaker because he had a very flexible schedule as Paula did not. And also she was making most of the money in the family. He wanted to have the primary responsibility now for raising Jason Paul, which meant that he had to have some source of income because he could only work part-time if he was going to take care of Jason Paul. And so he applied for what were called Social Security Child in Care Payments, which went to a surviving spouse. And what he was told by the Social Security system was, oh, no, child and care payments go only to widows, not to widowers. Because, of course, what man would want to stay home and take care of his kids? So you get stereotyping of men as well as stereotyping of women. And what RBG did was she taking this case to the court, which she argued before the court. Here's the first part of the transcript of her argument. What she did was typical of all of her cases. She said to the justices, okay, we're gonna look at the law, but remember what law is. Law is about the values that a society adopts in dealing with human beings. So I want you, the justices, to remember that we're dealing with human beings here. And that's why she starts by talking about Stephen Wiesenfeld and Paula Wiesenfeld and Jason Paul Wiesenfeld. And lo and behold, the court says, yep, there's something there. It was the first and only time that the court found unanimously in favor of an argument against a law that discriminated against on the basis of uh, discriminated against any men and women on the basis of right. But they couldn't agree on what the basis was. So you get one group of justices saying this is a women's rights case. Another one, men's rights case. Another one, children's rights case. And as, as Ruth said, among them, they covered all of the bases. Well, she went on from there to argue other cases. And as, as I, I said, I'm not going to go over these in any detail, but I can in the Q&A if anybody's particularly interested. But basically, again, Social Security regulations and then a number of cases where she managed to get rid of the automatic jury exemptions for women, but not for men, and thereby in effect undoing the decision that had been handed down in the case of Gwendolyn Hoyt. Just to show you what the attitude was of some of the justices, at least then, in arguing about in one of these jury cases where a man had been convicted by an all-male jury in a in, uh, situation where women, any woman could say, I'm a woman, therefore I don't want to sit on the jury. And Ruth said, well, that's like saying there's an automatic exemption for any man or any Jew or any Black. And Justice Rehnquist, thinking that this was a ha-ha moment, said, oh, you won't settle for back putting Susan B. Anthony on the new dollar then. And the court erupted in laughter. So she may have been winning some of these cases, but there was still an attitude that was not quite what she would have liked it to be. By the time she gave up her litigating career, which was in 1980, 
when President Jimmy Carter appointed her to the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals. Ruth Bader Ginsburg had become the go-to person in gender discrimination cases. And not only did she take all of the cases that are, that are listed here, she wrote endlessly for law reviews and for more popular outlets because she felt that educating the population was part of the struggle that she was part of. Well, she stayed on the DC Circuit Court of Appeals until 1993 when President Bill Clinton appointed her to the Supreme Court of the United States. By then, as she said frequently, she was number two, she wasn't number one because Sandra Day O'Connor had preceded her on the Supreme Court. But in 1996, the court heard a case that came from this August institution. And those of you who are based in the Washington area may recognize this. This is the Virginia Military Academy, a state-sponsored school, which had never in its 150-year history, never admitted a woman and saw no reason to do so now. A case was brought, and again, on the basis of the Equal Protection Clause, and the case was brought to the Supreme Court of the United States. Guess who wrote the court decision? That's Ruth Bader Ginsburg. And in her decision for the court, and it was a seven to one decision, um, the Justice Scalia dissented. And interestingly enough, um, Justice one of the one of the other justices uh, recused himself because he had a son who was at uh, VMI. In the opinion that RBG wrote, what she did was she laid down a new doctrine, which was that if a gender discrimination case comes to the Supreme Court, they will look at the relevant law with skeptical scrutiny. And they will wait to see whether the government can come up with an exceedingly persuasive justification for the law. So she didn't quite get the court to go all the way to suspect classification, but the court was no longer deciding on the basis of rational relation. It had moved, as you see, to substantial relations to the object and now skeptical scrutiny an exceedingly persuasive justification. So what she had done in her decade of litigation is she had managed to change the basis for decisions and she had managed to convince the justices of the United States that stereotyping and putting men and women in different silos actually was not only not a good idea, but a violation of the United States Constitution. And I'll stop at this point and look forward to your comments and questions. Thank you. Before I introduce our discussant, let me remind you that you can start getting in the queue if you have questions, the raise hand function, allows you to pose your question directly uh, to our panel and to the broader audience. If you use the Q&A function, you write that question in and I get to read it. So we prefer that you ask the question yourself, but it's your choice. But you can start getting in the queue now. All right. Our discussant this afternoon is Elizabeth Tandy Shermer, an associate professor of history at Loyola University in Chicago, where she teaches courses on labor, politics, and capitalism. She has written about those topics in various op-eds, in academic journals, and scholarly books, which include Sunbelt Capitalism, published in 2013, edited collections such as Barry Goldwater and the Transformation of American Politics, 2013 as well, The Right and Labor, a 2012 volume uh, co-edited with Nelson Lichtenstein, um, and recently uh, her book with Harvard University Press's uh, um, um, uh, uh, Belknap imprint, Indentured Students, which came out in 2021 
and which was the subject of a Washington history seminar here on Zoom. She's currently finishing a book on the public-private character of American higher education, tentatively titled The Business of Education. She is no stranger to the Washington history seminar, having served as a discussant a number of times, and we are delighted that you're able to join us this afternoon on very short notice. So, Kelly, welcome back. The Zoom room, yours. Thank you. And first and foremost, always thanks to the people behind the seminar, not just Eric, but also Rachel Wheatley, who does that behind the scenes work that made this seminar possible, including enabling me at the very last minute to substitute commentator. I do know, in fact, seeing in the in the audience that there's many people um, whose, whose expertise aligns even better with this wonderful book. I'm always delighted to take part in the seminar as an author, audience member, and commentator, but in this case, to have a chance to comment on Philippa Strom's new and very timely book on Ruth Bader Ginsburg. So for me, it was a great opportunity as a historian coming out of subfields of U.S. labor, capitalism, policy, where I endeavor to bring intersectional analysis to my research and analysis in the case of the student loan book, what is it about the laws and policies that have left women, particularly women of color, with more debt? Um, but also, it was an important opportunity as someone who teaches those topics. And this eminently readable book um, is also an important resource, especially, I would add, in recent years when I've had students wear their RBG paraphernalia to class but also stay after class to ask me questions about the Supreme Court's use of the shadow docket to let the Texas abortion law stand, and then the hearings on the Dobbs decision. And I'll take a moment here to credit Strum for explaining so eloquently in her book why Ford Foundation money limited what the Women's Rights Project could actually pursue. Ginsburg didn't work on the abortion cases, but did, up, did take up very important pregnancy cases. And I wish I had this book last year, and I'll bring it um, to my students' intent on law school about it after Thanksgiving break. First and foremost, Strum has done the hard work of showing the power and the importance of, Gin that Gins of the work Ginsburg did in the 1970s, decades before she would become a mainstream feminist and legal icon. And what's so vital about that argument, Strum has shown us the work it takes to get a case to and to make a compelling argument far better than the recent biopic, which she mentioned, and even that, oh, she didn't the biopic, but the documentary that she mentioned. One of the most vivid talking heads from that documentary was one of the male commentators describing the work that Ginsburg did in the 70s as knitting together jurisprudence about sex discrimination, a metaphor that she reportedly used as well. But a far more powerful quote that Strum used, Ginsburg's emphasis that, quote, real change, enduring change, happens one step at a time, end quote. And Ginsburg's open admission that she looked to Thurgold Marshall's use of building blocks to get the court to declare eventually separate but equal unconstitutional. What Strum's chapters powerfully show in this critical decade in U.S. jurisprudence, these steps or building blocks might seem small, like the Air Force couple ruled eligible for benefits after the woman in that marriage had left the service. But those inches mattered. And sometimes there would be a case that seemed to push the cause of gender equality a step back, like the 1974 Lafleur and Gedulde cases that established the male employee as the paradigm worker. Strum, like Ginsburg, never lost Sight, that people's lives were also a part of the cases listed in rulings, amicus briefs, textbooks, and footnotes. So Strum's attention to Unwood Air Force Captain Susan Strzok, given the choice of leaving the surface or terminating her pregnancy before the Roe decision, or the widower, Stephen Weisenfeld, simply asking for the access to child care resources a widow, widow would have had under the Social Security Act. And they both meant something, both to Ginsburg as a person, not just a lawyer, just as much as the outcomes did to real people facing the gender discrimination that Ginsburg stressed throughout her career harmed both men and women. But another truly refreshing aspect of Strum's new book is she stresses that Ginsburg was never the only person, never even the only woman lawyer, adv advancing the cause of women's rights or fighting sex discrimination. And that's important for highlighting the dangers of the personality cult that developed in the last years of Ginsburg life. Responsible for my students' t-shirts and narrowing our gaze to Ginsburg, the Supreme Court Justice, leaving out the hard work she did as a professor and a lawyer with both her students, other lawyers, including men and women, and organizations. 
and creating a personality cult that actually seems at odds with how Ginsburg carried herself in the world. You know, I've heard Dolly Lithwick describe her new book, Lady Justice, as telling the story of all those, quote, baby Ginsburgs fighting to save democracy now, which seems both an affront to the kind of mentorship Strum shows Ginsburg providing and infantilizing legal icons like Sally Yates, Stacey Abrams, and Anita Hill. But that narrowing also erases the history of the many fronts in the many struggles for gender equality, let alone equity and inclusion. So what happens when the public, the press, and the academy focus on one person? We collectively lose an understanding of the many people and actions involved for lasting change. So in Strum's book, that includes legal icons Dorothea Kenyon and Polly Murray's pressure and argument for the ACLU to actually start the women's rights project that Ginsburg joined, as well as the many other attorneys affiliated with the ACLU or starting orga other organizations like the Southern Poverty Law Center. And it also includes the ordinary people brave enough to stand up and demand their rights in courts, like divorced mother Sally Reed, who lost her son to suicide. And it was, as Strum emphasizes, the people willing to protest in other ways, including in the streets, that established the context to both inspire Ginsburg and set the stage for the women's rights projects and other organizations' case cases to even be heard before the court, let alone make those incremental legal steps forward and sometimes backwards. Yet the narrative that Strum gives us of Ginsburg and other lawyers in this decade also raises important questions for all of us, not just Strum to consider when the COVID-19 pandemic revealed the stark inequalities that have persisted and even worsened since the 1970s, which now in retrospect seem to have ushered in decades of political stagnation as well as worsening economic inequality. Is there something to learn about the steps made, or as Ginsburg called them, the half and confusing rights achieved, that can help us understand why? Since the early 1990s, women have been more likely to go to and graduate college, as well as be the sole breadwinner or equal contributor to household income. Yet women still earn pennies on the dollar, and it cannot be stressed enough, women of color earn even less than white women. And they were, during COVID, the first to leave the workforce and the ones to struggle to find their way back in. In considering the challenges women, especially women of color, face, does Strum's gripping account of the legal fights before the Supreme Court actually show us the limits of the court's power? Strum compellingly shows that Ginsburg's time in Sweden inspired her jurisprudence, especially in the context of parental leave for mothers and fathers and providing childcare, early experience in Sweden. In the US, there was limited child care during World War II and a dedicated push at the federal level for child care in the 1970s. But the best Ginsburg could do, and it was important, was to successfully fight for widower Stephen Weisenfeld to be eligible for the limited support in the 1935 Social Security Act. It would have taken an act of Congress to establish that support for everyone. And of course, it, child care, as well as elder care provisions, never got through a deeply divided Congress in the Biden administration's first two years, even though they were priorities in the Build Back Better agenda. But another helpful aspect of Strom's account to understand the persistence of inequality, how much Ginsburg was focused on ensuring the 1935 Social Security Act's many provisions were open to men and women equally. That offers a helpful reminder that the law, that that law, the Social Security Act, and other signature New Deal achievements, like the Federal Housing and Wagner Acts, had together supported the idea of a family wage for a male head of household, long before the 1970s Lafleur and Goldig cases. And as so many historians and eventually social scientists have emphasized, the white male worker was the focus. So in understanding the persistence of widening inequality, can we think of the built-in limitations of achieving equality and equity by trying to open up the benefits of a social security safety net to more people when even in the 1930s, it was designed to only be for some and even then not enough just a supplement to what employers offered. And that highlights how the basis of this country's entire social safety net, what other countries treat as basic citizenship rights, has remained tied to full-time work in specific sectors of the formal labor market. Hence making the time off for care of either children or elderly parent a real challenge. How important employment was underscores why Ginsburg and other lawyers were so focused on discrimination on the job, not just government support programs. 
But here, Ginsburg's victories and defeats in the 1970s raises the questions of the strategies civil rights organizations pursued after the passage of the 1964 Civil Rights Act. Scholars of the post-civil rights era no longer just emphasize militancy as found in the Black Panther Party and SNCC, but actually the fights in the courts to actually enforce the law. However, labor and legal historians have noted an important shift in pursuing collective rights in the 30s to individual rights in the 60s, even though there were important limits on who would benefit from the 1935 Wagner and Social Security Acts, they nevertheless put an emphasis on the collective good, the collective rights. Yet the 64 Civil Rights Act focused on the discrimination an individual faced. And business interests detested the potential power of the federal government to meddle in decisions of hiring and firing. Yet, as an attorney later noted, Executives soon found it was a lot cheaper to handle an individual case of discrimination than raise their entire workforce's wages by $1, something a union would be empowered to bargain for and actually enforce. I thought a lot about that question of enforcement when Strom quoted Justice Brennan, who noted General Electric, one of the most aggressively anti-union um, firms in the post-war period, had, quote, a history of practices that were served to undercut the employment opportunities for women. It's a powerful reminder of how much power remained in the hands of employers who could find cheap ways to comply with the law when the ordinary men and women Ginsburg represented struggled to afford the represent representation to enforce it even in the 70s. Cost was especially a barrier to plaintiffs of color, hence the need for the Southern Poverty Law Center in the post-civil rights era. And I bring that up because Strum emphasizes Ginsburg's efforts to get sex or gender to be treated as a suspect category like race. And that was a challenge. There was no differences between the races, but biologically women, not men could become pregnant. Something Strum highlights and explains very helpfully in the book. But there seems missed opportunities for Ginsburg to take to have taken what we now might call an intersectional approach. Yes, Kimberly. Crenshaw introduced the phrase in 1989 to describe the intersections of race, class, and gender. And of course, there are many more categories that we use now. But Ginsburg took inspiration from Dorothy Kenyon and Polly Murray's pathbreaking article, Jane Crow. Strum emphasizes Ginsburg's searching for the right cases to bring to the court, sometimes being derailed by what she got. But in her search to show how sex discrimination impacted men, was she unknowingly and unintentionally limiting her? her gaze. And I bring this up, the search for the right cases made me think of Polly Murray, a Black lesbian who used he, him pronouns in private correspondence. She was not the right case to get the backing to try and fight to enroll in UNC's law school in the late 1930s. She was not the right case to be the face of a bus boycott like Rosa Parks, or to get credit until years later for the Lincoln thinking behind Marshall's argument in Brown. What um, could have happened if one of those perfect cases had been to protect an African-American woman's right to decide what to do with her pregnancy while enlisted, or if it had been a Latino widower seeking the child support he needed, could that have helped both show how the intersections between race, sex, and class made them all suspect categories while simultaneously shifting popular perceptions on who was guaranteed bodily autonomy and the basic employment rights that other countries treat as basic citizenship rights? The first social security cards, after all, have a place for a worker's signature. It's all in employment. But since I'm back to social security, its most well-known provision remain the public pension benefits. In fact, when the, it's in the press, social security, everyone thinks about the pensions. And those were raised within Ginsburg's lifetime to 70 and a half. That's when you have to start taking your benefits. And every financial advisor tells you to wait as long as possible. One of the reasons those pensions were included in the Social Security Act was to get older workers out of the labor market, which both reflects the male head of household whose wages could keep his wife and children out of the labor force, especially after child labor was made illegal, but also to limit the competition for jobs, a part of the way that New Dealers conceived of the labor market where, with the education provisions originally the New Deal for college, meant that workers, mostly men, would only be competing for jobs between the ages of 25 and 65. The point was to make provisions for people to be able to retire and open up opportunities for the next generation. I raise that point because I stand behind my enthusiasm for Strum to highlight the importance of legal work Ginsburg did in the 1970s, especially since it raises so many questions for scholars of policy, labor, and capitalism to consider. And they are arguably absolutely more important than the votes on the court as a justice. 
but other legal experts have noted that Ginsburg biography ends with a decision not to retire. She was one of the oldest justices, she was not, excuse me, one of the, the oldest justices when Democrats had a supermajority in Congress in Obama's first years, but she had a very important vote. She had such an important place in the court. She, like many of us, could not have predicted that Mitch McConnell would refuse to even hold a hearing to consider Merrick Garland's nomination. However, by the 2000s, when George W. Bush boldly nominated the very young John Roberts to secede Rehnquist, it was no longer true that, quote, elevation to the nation's highest court normally comes at the capstone of attorney's career, not the beginning. That's how Strand explained why a young Ginsburg faced nine old men at the bunch. And of course, after the Bork's failed nomination, we could not never see these nominations as anything but political. Ginsburg could not have known she would die, of course, like her opera buddy Scalia before an election. But I wonder how secure on paper and in practice the confusing rights, as she called them, that she helped secure in the 70s are now, both because of the current composition of the court, but also continued efforts to undermine the many New Zealand air protections anchored to employment in the formal labor market, not the gig economy that so many citizens of color, immigrants, especially women, find themselves in. 50 years from now, could someone argue that Ginsburg's decision not to retire helped unravel the work that she and other attorneys had done in the 70s? And I ask that because it is a version of the question my students have asked me after class while wearing their RBG t-shirts. And the next time they do, I'll point them to Strom's work that points to the many people, not just a singular person, that it took to take women from no rights to half rights to confusing rights in the 70s. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ellie. Philippa, would you like to respond to that before we open it up for questions? Well, just a couple of, of quick things. And thank you so much, Professor Sherman. I mean, thank you. That, that is really just right on point and, and wonderful. Um, just, I think it was absolutely right of you to emphasize the uh, societal situation in which all of this happened and the uh, RBG's um, insistence on giving credit to other women and bringing other women into, into the mix because she certainly did understand she couldn't do it alone. But also I think the way you talked about the limits of court action, that, that's so very important. And it is one of the things that she understood, which is why she was tireless in joining boards of other organizations and writing them stuff. Um, if you've read Nina Totenberg's recent book about dinners with, with uh, Ruth, one of the things that Totenberg mentions is that she cold called RBG back in the seventies when Ruth was talking about the equal protection clause uh, protecting women as, as well as uh, racial minorities. And Ruth spent an hour, according to Totenberg, Ruth spent an hour on the phone with her explaining that whole thing. Well, that was typical, not only because she would talk to anybody who was really interested, but because she understood she was talking to a journalist. And a journalist would then be able to influence the public, perhaps. And that was part of the context in which court action would take place. Without an informed public, you're not going to push the court to where it wants to go, however brilliant your litigators may be. So she really did. She really did get that. One, Just one last um, word. She did try to take uh, a couple of cases that involved Black women. And the, the most um, striking one was of a young woman, a young Black woman in the South who was sterilized against her will, um, thought she was having a partial sterilization. And only years later, when she tried to have children, discovered that she had been fully sterilized. And uh, we tried to take that case to the Supreme Court, but the statute of limitations on the law that had made that possible had expired and it just couldn't happen. Um, I don't know to what extent it would be fair to say that um, Ruth was less aware of the struggles of non-white women in those years. I think she was well aware of them, if only because she had the mentorship of Pauli Murray, uh, 
Um, but again, uh, none of that to uh, take away from any of, of, of your wonderful comments. I will just throw in one last thing that just occurred to me, because I don't know whether we're confusing the audience because both you and I are using the word sex and gender almost interchangeably. And so this being one of my favorite anecdotes, um, initially what, when RBG brought cases, she would talk about sex discrimination. And her briefs were being typed by a secretary at the Columbia Law School. One day, the secretary said to her, you know, you use the word sex all the time. And you're arguing before all these men. When you say sex, they're not thinking of what you're thinking of. So why don't you use a different word? Why don't you use gender? And that's why from then on, she was arguing against gender discrimination, not sex discrimination. Eric, I think we're ready for All right. questions. Thank you. We have a few people with hands up. Please feel free to join them, folks. Jill Norgren uh, is first in the queue. Jill, if you would unmute yourself, you may pose your question. Yes, Hello. thank you. Uh, thanks to both both uh, women for terrific uh, presentations. I wanted to ask Flipstrom about strategy and timing. Um, if we go back to that old classic simple justice about the winning of African-American civil rights, um, there's a discussion of sort of competing agendas among rights lawyers and organizations. I wonder to what degree um, Ginsburg had any problems in terms of controlling her agenda uh, separate from the institutional issue posed by Ford's uh, decision to only uh, fund certain kinds of cases. Thanks. Oh, thank you. Thank you for that question. And Jill Norgren, um, you may know, is not only a former Wilson Center fellow, but an author of fabulous uh, books on women's history, including a wonderful biography of, of Bella Lockwood. On the agenda question, absolutely she had a problem with it. I mean, first of all, as we both said, there were lots of other women at this point who were stepping up and litigating. And the way they brought cases, what cases they chose to bring, um, the basis for those cases, by and large, RBG couldn't control that. It was one of the reasons that she cooperated to the max with anybody who was bringing cases in an attempt to push them in the direction in which she wanted to go. She had a very clear vision of what the steps should be, one, two, three, four, and she wanted to keep going in that direction. But of course, as you know, the only one of the six cases that she argued before the Supreme Court that she lost was in a case called Con v. Shevin, which involved a widower in Florida who applied for a tax uh, exemption that was available to widows and saying simply this is, is sex discrimination. And at the time that he brought the case, he um, went to the ACLU of Florida with the case and what the young lawyer who had taken over the legal directorship of the ACLU of Florida didn't know was that while ACLU affiliates all over the country are free to bring whatever cases they want, if those cases are going to go to the Supreme Court, they're supposed to be, one is supposed to check in first with national ACLU. And the young man didn't know that. And so he appealed the case to the Supreme Court and it was accepted before RBG knew anything about it. Well, when she found out, she was appalled because she understood she had gradually been bringing the justices along to the point where they were perhaps ready to say, if women aren't treated equally, that's unfair. But now here was a man coming along and saying, and it, uh, I've been treated unfairly, but the state of Florida was saying, no, what we're doing here is we're helping women because historically women haven't earned as much as men have. So if all of a sudden they find themselves widowed, they need a little extra help from the state, whereas men don't. 
And RBG understood, no, 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 no. Here I've been saying, no, you've got to treat people equally. And here you're being told, no, treat them unequally because that's good for women. Just the same way it was good for women to be kept out of uh, laws, uh, the lawyer's offices or off cherries. And so she took the case because at that point, the ACLU felt it had no option but to go ahead with the case and to have the best possible person argue it before the court. Not surprisingly, she lost it um, in part because Justice William Douglas, who wrote the opinion for the court, was the son of a mother who had been widowed too young and whose family had become almost abjectly poor. And he understood the plight of widows and wrote a decision for the court in effect saying, yes, fine to treat women differently in this situation. So that was more than uh, an indication of how little control over the agenda she had. Thank you. Sonia Michelle, your hand is up. Please unmute. Join the conversation. Hey. Hi, uh, Flip. It sounds like a fantastic book. I can't wait to read it. And thanks very much to Elizabeth Shermer for her very interesting comments. Um, I have a couple of questions. One is, Flip, I, I didn't write it down, but I think you said something to the effect at the beginning of your talk that Ruth Bader Ginsburg wasn't that extraordinary. And it doesn't, it sounds like, in fact, given the obstacles she faced, she was quite extraordinary. So I have a, a couple of questions about that. What, to what extent do you think she relied on her training, her law school training? To what extent did she have to deviate from it? Um, did she do that consciously or did she just kind of said, yeah, I'll do what I have to do. Um, and, and you know, so what, in other words, what is the relationship between the way she approached cases and what her training was? And by the same token, what kinds of obstacles, I'm sure she faced, she did face, what kind of obstacles did she have to face teaching uh, women in the law at Columbia? How much support did she get? I mean, they hired her deliberately to do that. Um, how much support did she get for her colleagues, from her colleagues there? And then a second question has to do with, you talked about her relationship to her, her trying to build, build gradually and bring people along and to get, uh, find allies where she could. Obviously, when she was on the court, she couldn't, you know, really relate that easily to the women's movement or to other allies or, or to Congress for that matter. But in the time when she was at the ACLU, um, to what, it, how did she think about the women's movement? Did she think, given that she became something of a gradualist, um, did she think that the women's movement, and of course it's, it's not, uh, it's not monolithic. Did she think that certain parts of the women's movement were maybe moving, moving too fast or being too radical or how does she think about that? Thank you. There are a number of questions there. Yeah, uh, a number of questions. And thank you, Sonia, just for anybody who doesn't know, uh, Sonia followed me as director of the Division of U.S. Studies at the Wilson Center and is one of the, um, the great scholars of, of women's history. Um, Sonia, first of all, the, the question about extraordinary, I, I never said she wasn't extraordinary. I said I didn't think she was extraordinary as a justice, which is something different. And what I meant by that, and I hope that I didn't uh, misspeak here, was that while she had a good, solid career as a judge in justice, it wasn't so head and shoulders above everybody else that that alone I would have gotten her the kind of adulation that she enjoyed towards um, the end of her life. Um, on the relying on law school, her law school training, sure she did, but she also relied, as Professor Sherman mentioned, on some of the litigators who went before, particularly Thurgood Marshall, and the way he went step by step in uh, bringing cases. He also relied on Justice Brandeis and his insistence on bringing sociological facts into his arguments before the Supreme Court. And she said, basically, that those were the two people who had most influenced her as she brought her litigation um, and the question of getting support from the Columbia Law School, I don't know what support she did or did not get from her colleagues. Certainly, 
the law school itself supported her in the way it would any other law school professor, but more than that, in the way it agreed for her to be working half time for the Women's Rights Project, but also in agreeing that she could use her course on women in the law, her seminar on women in the law, um, as unpaid labor, if you will, for some of her cases, so that those students in her course who wanted to work on her cases with her were more than welcome to do so. And many of them became uh, first-rate litigators for gender equality themselves, in, in part that what she gave them in effect was an internship. And then finally, her relationship to the women's movement, an interesting question. She was, and, and this may sound like a, a strange word to use in the context of RBG, she was basically conservative. She believed in the law, which is a conservative institution. As far as I know, she was never out on the streets in marches or anything of that kind. Not that she denied their validity, but it just wasn't something that she wanted to do. And she certainly said on various occasions that there were different ways about fighting for women's equality. And so I don't think she was scornful of other aspects of the women's movement, but neither was she necessarily involved in all of them. Thank you. We have a number of questions in the Q&A. And I will pose an early question from David Sobelson. And this is a little question, perhaps. Did Ruth Bader Ginsburg's advocacy make the Equal Rights Amendment unnecessary? Oh, good heavens, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, and she was a very big supporter of the Equal Rights Amendment. No, no. Um, if we had the Equal Rights Amendment, I can't say that that would have done something for the Dobbs decision, but certainly um, one of the things that she said, uh, Professor Shermer uh, mentioned the case uh, that she brought, uh, Frontiero versus Richardson, in which an Air Force officer realized she wasn't getting the same benefits for her family that a, a man in her uh, in his situation would have gotten. And once the court decided in her favor in that case, she said, well, I thought it would just be a five-year romp after that to full legal gender equality. Well, it wasn't. And what she said frequently was, well, we needed the ERA. So certainly, as I say, she was a fervent supporter of it. Thank you. Another small question. Elizabeth Ecker asks, we still have not solved paying women for unpaid labor. Women have more rights, but still do most of the unpaid labor. How could we solve this? And yes, this goes beyond the scope of the book, I understand, but I think the book has opened up a number of very large issues. That's perfectly true, and I wish I could give you an answer, a simple answer to that one, but I certainly cannot. Uh, what do we do about unpaid labor? I guess the most we can do is is talk about it endlessly and try to um, try to think the way some many people already have about trying to quantify. Uh, what unpaid labor it is worth. I don't, I'm not sure that's the right way to go about it, but I think what we need basically are societal discussions about these things. I, but as you, as you say, that is beyond the purview of law as such. Um, Elizabeth, do you have one I actually, I was thinking too, is like, I mean, it's such a complex question because it also goes to the question of enforcement and how is it that this could actually be enforced and, and done. And, and that's a, it's a different aspect of it, but also I think it goes to, changing what is actually re recognized as labor, what is actually recognized as work. And that to me, it does come so foundationally back to that no matter how much the labor market has changed and industries have changed in this country, we're still kind of rooted in this manufacturing 
um, mentality coming out of the 1930s that we struggle to, especially when I teach, ask my students what a union is, the first thing they ask, talk about is West Virginia minors when they've all been Chicago public school students and they have one of the most powerful unions and not actually recognizing the many different labor around them. And maybe that's changing, but I, I think it's a key aspect of it too is, and this is where I think the the power of um, Philippa, the point you made about um, when she's in Sweden and seeing a recognition of parenting as work and something worthy of being supported, that seems a step forward. And especially now that we're dealing with in this new era, the possibility of doing likelihood that you're going to be doing elder care of recognizing care as something that needs to be recognized as work and fundamentally supported for the good of society. And I think this is the, ch the challenge of how much we're rooted in laws fought out in the 1930s that still are not freeing us to see the world that we're living in now. So Sonia Michelle in the Q&A has added to this conversation and says, uh, we should also think about the kinds of work that replace unpaid labor, that is domestic work and care work, which is seriously undervalued, unregulated, et cetera, et cetera. And then she closes with, subject for another seminar uh, with a question mark. Uh, and I think that is indeed uh, the case. But would I be wrong in thinking um, that in terms of the broader question uh, that was posed by Elizabeth Ecker about unpaid labor, um, uh, the gender division of labor in the home, that this is a realm, at least at this point in time, um, that is not touched by law. And that the approach that Ginsburg took addresses certain kinds of issues, but not other kinds of issues like this. And this gets back to the earlier question about social movements um, and Ginsburg's role to social movements, but in this case, the role that social movements would play that are different than the challenge through the court courthouse route. Um, would I be wrong in thinking that? Yeah, well, absolutely. You're, you're right. I mean, um, what I was looking at in the book, obviously, is just one part of the whole story, which is the, the you know, the court stuff. But and, and as I said earlier, what happens in the court reflects what's going on in society. But absent um, societal movements, absent discussions, conversations in society, absent, perhaps, some kind of large scale movement, you're not going to get major changes in a society. And certainly, remember, there are, there are a lot of questions that we deal with today that Ginsburg couldn't possibly have dealt with back in the 1970s. Again, what we do in terms of understanding our society and what's needed is incremental or evolutionary. Uh, there are things that we just didn't think of in the 70s that, that uh, you know, we think of now. So yeah, let's all get out there on the streets or in our writing or whatever and move forward. You're here. So Joe Luttrell um, asks a different kind of question um, and asks you to compare or contrast the pre-court careers of Louis Brandeis uh, and Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Oh, that's really interesting. Um, Okay, I would say that they both had uh, enormous impact on the law. Um, he more in the way law was practiced, because you may remember that, um, and I alluded to this briefly, that he emphasized uh, sociological facts as the basis for law and the basis for court decisions. And that was really, really revolutionary when he did that at the very uh, beginning of, of the 20th century. Um, what she did was not so much um, change the kind of thinking um, procedurally that went into court cases, but what she did was, was confined to one very particular area of the law and trying to change the thinking having to do with that area. But I would say, I, I'm, I'm glad you chose 
Brandeis and Ginsburg, and I think one would have to add uh, Thurgood Marshall, certainly, as people whose pre-court careers were infinitely more important than their court careers, however important their court careers might have been. And I think one could make the argument that Brandeis's court career was of, of really some great significance. However, they certainly, I can't think of anybody else off the top of my head, maybe somebody else can. Um, they strike me as the three whose pre-court careers are the things that really made their place in history. I was struck both in the book and in your slide um, that you showed early on um, uh, of the materials as part of her brief uh, that Ginsburg presented to the court. And there was much law, but there was, like Brandeis, much not law. Uh, and there was a not insubstantial section from de Beauvoir uh, and the second sex. Did she really expect justices to read this? And did they? <laughs> Just wondering. <laughs> no, I don't think she expected that. Uh, to head off to the library and hit all of the titles that she, she listed. But I think what she did, and I think she was successful in this, was she made them aware of the great number of works that she could rely upon the great number of works that um, if it showed them what she wanted them to see. And while I just simply showed you the pages from the brief that list all of those works, she used the arguments for many of those works and the information and the statistics, et cetera, from many of those works in the body of her briefs themselves. Thank you. We've got two hands up, and I'm going to call on John Martin first, but Nelson Lichtenstein, don't go away. Um, so we'll get to you um, as soon as uh, John's uh, question is posed uh, and addressed. John, welcome back. Thank you very much. Philippa, what a wonderful book. I'm so proud to have been sitting next to you on our seventh floor uh, over the years and seeing the way this book is put together. As a journalist, as a, I call myself a recovering journalist, that you mentioned Tina Nina Totenberg, and I wonder, from your point of view, should journalists spend more time trying to to uh, understand the law by talking to the principals in, in it? A lot of what journalism schools teach, and I I taught for ten years at Columbia, is that you can't get too close to somebody because. It's just not right. And I wonder if, if uh, Nina's example proves that to be incorrect. Yeah, well, I didn't really mean to uh, stick in a commercial for Nina's book. Um, and, and certainly I think what she says in the book about her relationship with RBG raises ethical questions that are troubling. Um, but certainly on the on the larger question of should journalists know more about the law? Absolutely. And not just people who cover the Supreme Court or whatever, that I think if journalists understood more about the law and the impact of law, that they would be able to um, write somewhat more insightfully about what it is that's going on in society. Thank you. Nelson Lichtenstein, calling in from the West Coast. Nelson, welcome. Go ahead. Well, the West Coast is very far away, Eric. There's his lead turning. <laughs> it is. His mute is turned off, but we're not hearing him. Nelson? Maybe he could put his question in the chat. A very good idea. Ellie? It's a microphone problem. Never mind. Probably is. All right. Well, 
I will be looking for your question in the uh, uh, in the Q and A, Nelson. If you can't get that uh, uh, to to work, um, this question may be a little bit um, off of the topic of the book on gender equality law, uh, but uh, Ruben uh, Patina asks about her decisions with regard to. Uh, Native Americans um, uh, and tribal sovereignty. Uh, and he asks if you would elaborate on her, what he calls American, uh, her uh, notorious opinion uh, in the Native American sovereignty case. Uh, is that part of the legacy? That that may be too far afield from, from your topic, but uh, I invite you to consider it if you wish. Um, thank you, but I would have to go back to the decision and read it before commenting. Okay, very good. I am wondering, and this too might be a bit beyond what you focus on in the book, but you you gave a, a very um, uh, spot on answer with regard to Ginsburg, uh, Ginsburg's relationship to social movements um, and feminist organizing um, in the 1990s. 70s so that that she was aware of this but she was not a participant um uh, in some of the more activist uh, dimensions so my question is was there a critique by some of these movements that she was not a part of or fully engaged in of the approaches that she took um i imagine there certainly was of the way the court handled many of these issues. Um, but I'm wondering if Ginsburg herself, as a attorney with the ACLU taking on these cases, um, if there was a feminist critique uh, of the way the law was being used. Well, there was certainly in, in um, one respect, and I, I mentioned this briefly in the book, that in emphasizing to the justices, the fact that women had to be treated equally and trying to teach them that. What she did not do is look at the instances where in order to be treated equally, women have to be treated differently. And specifically, and I, I mentioned in this book, the great example of that is having time and space in a workplace for nursing mothers to be able to nurse their children. Um, you know, certainly that is treating women differently, but it's, it's necessary if one is going to treat them equally. And she was criticized um, for that. And yet she felt very strongly that whether or not she agreed with that, and she certainly did. I, I just a uh, side note here. Um, she set up, a little childcare center in the ACLU, just for the people in the Women's Rights Project, so that they could bring their kids and particularly nursing babies to work with them. So she was well, well aware of, of that necessity. But what she said frequently was that she had to give the justices the equivalent of a second grade education, that they knew nothing whatsoever about women's status, or how that status was hurt by the law, or how the fact of stereotyping men and women were hurting both. And therefore, she, with her eyes completely on the prize, said, I've got to keep showing them that women have to be treated equally. Later on, perhaps, we can talk about, yes, to what extent does equality mean treating people differently? But this is what I've got to do now, and this is what I'm going to continue doing. Thank you. Glenna Matthews, hand is up. Unmute. Join the conversation. Glenna. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes. Great. Um, I want to get back to the issue of uh, women in care work. I have long felt uh, too often it's seen as an individual matter of negotiating with a partner. And it, I think this is a great example of how collective action is needed. Um, we need stronger unions. We need to organize more sectors of the workforce. And we need to 
make sure that women are in leadership positions in order for unions to negotiate. If people, I have studied tech, the tech industry myself, the working hours there are completely inhumane. And um, if you have incredibly long work days, nobody has energy for um, for care work. And given, I think it's such a good point, elder care is going to take more time. We need to have jobs created that allow time for care work, or um, it's just going to be incredibly burdensome, unfortunately, mostly on women. Thank Kelly, you. do you want to come in? No, I I mean, I, com I completely agree with that. And actually, Nelson put through his thing in the chat asking about Ginsburg on unions. And the ones that I know is that she sided with the liberal minority in the last years of her life, like, for example, writing against the Janice decision. So she did not write that. But there's one actually right before Janice that people I, that got overshadowed by the Janice decision. And I believe she might have actually read it, but I didn't I wasn't prepared to take that. But I think is that she she did. But I think it is really those questions, as um, Glenna just um, mentioned, is it is that's where the justice on the court can only do so much. And the lawyers representing them, including in the 70s, can only do so much. And how much and it seems to me that was very powerful. Um, Philippa, in the book that you wrote about recognizing the bravery of the people willing to come forward and actually pursue and try and get their rights adjudicated. That that's what it comes to. And also that you're going to need to go into the streets as well. Um, as a matter of fact. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Nelson also writes that he is and others are just off of a big picket line out at the University of California. Uh, okay. So there is uh, uh, labor uh, action uh, going on. Um, we are. Sonia Michelle. So this will be the last observation that I, I share. Um, she uh, notes uh, there is an important organization, the Domestic Workers Alliance, which is doing good work. But the issue is even more complicated because a lot of this is being performed by migrants or immigrants, many of whom are undocumented um, because there is no visa dedicated to migrants who intend to do this kind of work, unlike, say, those who want to work in hospitality. I unfortunately have to draw this session to a close. Um, I want to thank Philippa and uh, Ellie a great deal uh, for this session. Uh, the book, I should point out, um, is eminently readable. Um, it is a work of legal history of a sort, uh, but it brings alive the individuals that uh, Ginsburg represents, uh, makes their stories quite vivid, uh, and addresses the larger uh, legal strategies uh, and precedents uh, that uh, Ginsburg uh, works very hard uh, to, to uh, establish. Uh, so it's a very readable uh, as well as important book. And with that, uh, I want to say thank you to everyone who has been with us this afternoon, and I would invite you to join us after the Thanksgiving weekend um, on Monday, November 28th, when we reconvene at 4 p.m. Eastern time for a Washington History Seminar panel on new scholarship on U.S. intelligence history uh, with authors Thomas Borghart and Nicholas Reynolds, who will be speaking on their recent books, Need to Know, World War II and the Rise of American Intelligence, and Covert Legions, U.S. Army Intelligence in Germany from 1944 to 1949. And with that, thank you all very much. Stay safe, take care, and have a great Thanksgiving weekend. <laughs>